ارحب بكم اساتذه الافاضل في اللقاء المتجدد مع اون ذا شولدر اوف جانس على اكتاف العمالقه مجموعه لقاءات مع كبار علماء الفيزياء النظريه ومختلف اختصاصات الفيزياء. هذه اللقاءات تتم بالتعاون بين مؤسسه نواه للتنميه العلميه مع الدكتور اكرم فلاح مشكورا الذي يتواصل مع كبار العلماء ويؤمن اللقاءات معهم. اليوم ضيفنا سيكون اللقاء المتجدد مع الضيف كامران فافا البروفيسور الفيزيائي النظري الكبير الذي درس في معهد ام اي تي ماساتشوستس انستتيوت اوف تكنولوجي وحصل على شهاده دكتوراه في الفيزياء من جامعه برينستون تحت اشراف العالم الكبير ومؤسسه نظريه الاوتار ادوارد بيتون نال كامران ضافه العديد من الجوائز اخرها كانت جائزه الانجازات في الفيزياء الاساسيه بريك ثرو برايس ان فاندمنتال فيزيكس عن اسهاماته في الفيزياء او في نظريه الاوتار الفائقه. حديثنا اليوم مع الدكتور كامران فافا حيكون سيكون حول سوامب لاند كونجكتر سوامب لاند كونجكتر رؤيه كامران فافا للاوتار وتوحيد وقدرته على توحيد النظريات الفيزيائيه المختلفه. نترككم مع المحاضره الغنيه والشيقه والممتعه والمفيده ان شاء الله مع الدكتور كامران فافا. ننوه الى انه بعد المحاضره سيكون هناك جلسه للاسئله جلسه مفتوحه للاسئله يمكن لاي شخص يود طرح السؤال ان يتواصل مباشره مع الدكتور كمال فافا نتمنى ان لا تظهر الاسئله الان سواء على الشات او في الشكل الصوتي نؤجلها الى ما بعد الجلسه ان شاء الله دكتور اكرم اوكي سو ثانك يو سو ماتش احمد فور ذيس انتروداكشن اند ثانك يو سو ماتش فور Uh, Professor Cameron Vafa for uh, accepting my uh, second invitation. I mean, uh, the first one was public, the second one, this one is, uh, I mean, more uh, spe uh, specialized. And uh, uh, this one, he will discuss about, about the state of the art uh, of string theory. Uh, so uh, it's about uh, swampland. And this is, it's uh, just uh, for a few lines, this is, uh, Um, I mean, uh, effective low theories, which are looking um, uh, mathematically and physically consistent, but they don't have UV uh, compilation in string theory or in the string landscape. So um, thank you so much for joining me. And thank you so much also for the big names in the Arabic world. I mean, the professors and graduate students. And uh, please, uh, Well, Professor Vafa, you can start your, uh, I mean, talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohamed, for this kind introduction. And Ahmed, uh, it's a, my great pleasure to share this uh, talk here for, uh, for the Arab audience. Uh, I hope to have similar occasions in the future as well, to have uh, direct interactions with my Arab colleagues. Uh, so here I'm going to review some of the work I've been uh, mostly been working in the past 10, 15 years. And it is related to uh, the notion of string landscape and the swamp land. So quantum field theories without gravity, uh, one could say we pretty much understand it. So in other words, there is a relatively well posed questions of what it means and we kind of understand it. Uh, they beautifully describe the interaction of all elementary particles that we know. So we usually use Feynman diagrams and the, the, their very well-defined rules. And we really understand how to describe interaction of all elementary particles using these, uh, these diagrams and then more generally the notion of quantum field theories. As long as there is no gravity, things are easier. So, so the theory is pretty much understand, understood without gravity. But we need the gravity because we live in the universe which does have gravity. So to include gravity, uh, that is in this case, what I mean is that Einstein's theory, uh, we need to what we call couple uh, the quantum field theory to gravity. And we need to consider a fluctuating space time instead of fixed flat space. So we want the, we want the thing to vibrate the whole space time also to be kind of a little bit uh, fuzzy and, and fluctuating. So these particles are moving in a fluctuating background. So in addition to the, when we consider the action, in addition to the action involving the usual matter fields, we need to introduce the metric for arbitrary backgrounds, 
and also introduced the Einstein-Hilbert action, which is the curvature term here. And then in addition to integrating over the gauge field and matter fields, we have to also integrate over the metric, the fluctuation, and that is the usual uh, method we promote classical theories to quantum field theories. However, this approach does not work. There are infinities that appear in the evaluation of Feynman diagrams. And so the conventional approach to quantizing gravity does not work as Feynman discovered in 1960s. The most natural conclusion from this would have been gravity cannot be coupled to quantum fields that gravity cannot be quantized and should always be viewed as only as a background. However, that is not satisfactory because we do have both quantum mechanics and we know we have dynamical gravity. Therefore, we better be able to combine gravity with quantum theory. String theory solves this issue. The point particles are replaced so if you think about elementary particles as point light, they are replaced by extended objects. And in this case, a one dimensional string. So from far away, a string, if you go far away, a string might look like a particle, it's like a point. But if you zoom in, it will have a more structure and become one dimensional. The infinitely many additional oscillation modes that a string has, so you have these vibrating string modes, and these vibrating string modes turn out to cure the infinities that Feynman diagrams have, and the infinities disappear. So we don't get any inconsistencies. And so this involves replacing Feynman diagrams by the new diagram, which we call the word sheet diagrams, where you replace the word lines by word sheets, which are like these tubes connected, as you can see in this picture. But the natural question is, can we get every consistent quantum field theory in four dimensions coupled to gravity from string theory? Because there's, there's not just our universe, but there could be any potential consistent quantum theory. And you might ask whether you can include all of them in a consistent quantum theory of gravity. String theory comes with six extra dimensions. In other words, in addition to three space and one time, we also have six additional spatial directions, spatial dimensions. These should be viewed as compact, tiny spaces, which have so far avoided detection. Many solutions to what the extra compact dimensions can look like exist. Here I have drawn a caricature, just like a cartoon of how they would look like potentially, but they are very complicated to draw, needless to say, because they're six dimensional. So you can think about you know, the external dimensions as somehow compact space and at each point in space, so these yellow lines are like macroscopic space, you can have a particular geometry that you have in mind. So typically we take one of these geometries and we assume that's the same over all of the space and usually we take it to be static. So for example, here I'm denoting the macroscopic directions here by this blue sheet. So these are the large three spatial large directions. I'm drawing two of the three dimensions here. And over each point in this space, you should imagine there's a compact tiny space, six dimensional. Here I'm drawing two of the six dimensions. And you can have, for example, strings, which could be wrapped around various cycles of this extra dimensional space, which from the perspective of our space look like particles. So, should, so you would ask, if I want to get, uh, let's say I'm interested in describing a theory in four dimensions, which has gauge symmetry SU4 with two generations of matter. Well, then you have to choose a particular shape, Calabria, and the topology and so on are all fixed so that you get rise to this kind of a group with this generation. Or somebody might say, I want a different group. I want SU3 times SU5 with a different representation of charged matter then you'll have to use a different space. So then the question arises, if I ask you an arbitrary consistent quantum field theory, can I choose a six dimensional compactification of string theory 
is there a vacuum of string theory which gives rise to this consistent quantum field theory? In fact, this is the surprise. It seems we cannot get arbitrary quantum field theories. Even if the quantum field theory by itself is consistent, somehow, if you want to get it mixed with gravity, it somehow does not arise in string theory. So this, in fact, points to the fact that we only seem to get a finite number of quantum field theories from string theory. In fact, there are infinitely many consistent quantum field theories if you did not include gravity. As soon as you include gravity, out of that infinite set, only a few remain. And these are like a dual subset of good quantum field theories which can couple to quantum gravity. So let me give you an example. Suppose you're interested in a theory in four dimensions. Suppose you want to compactify strings so that you have six compact spaces and three plus one large dimensions. And suppose you want to have matter fields with maximum supersymmetry, which if you want to have matter fields is n equals to four supersymmetry. And you can ask, okay, what is the gauge symmetry? What, is, what kind of gauge groups can I get? It turns out that the gauge symmetry that you get is restricted. And in fact, the rank of the gauge group is always less than 23. So for example, if you want to get a gauge symmetry of SUM, then it turns out that if M is bigger than 23, you can never get such a theory. And it seems like it's inconsistent. It should be inconsistent. So, so, there's, so out of infinite possibilities, namely any M, you only get a finite number of them. Namely, you only get Ms which are less than 23. So the quantum field theories that arise, uh, quantum field theories from string theory therefore form a measure zero of consistent quantum field theories. It appears that Feynman was almost right. A generic consistent quantum field theory cannot be consistently coupled to gravity. So this raises two questions. Does the fact that most quantum field theories do not arise in string theory a deficiency of string theory or a general conclusion about consistency requirements for coupling to quantum gravity. So we want to know if it's our deficiency or there's more deeper, deeper than that. Evidence is emerging that this is not a deficiency of string theory, but subtle reasons for consistency of quantum gravity lead to inconsistencies for all quantum field theories which couple to gravity except for a finite number of them. There are connections with basic facts of quantum gravity, such as unitarity and quantum consistency of black holes, which are key ingredients for this point. Secondly, it is natural to ask what criteria distinguish a good quantum field theory, something which we say is part of the string landscape, from bad ones, from bad quantum field theories, what we call swampland, which do not arise in consistent quantum gravity theories. The program to try to distinguish these criteria, which distinguishes bad from good, is called the Swampland program. So you can imagine the space of all possible quantum field theory is a vast, vast space, but only a few of them can arise by, cho by choice of compactification of string theory. So in other words, you can imagine, let's say this green space here is the space of all possible quantum field theories and almost all of it belongs to the swampland. Only a few of them are consistent. That's what we call the landscape. And only one of them, hopefully one of them, is the universe we live in, which is called the standard model. So our universe is part of hopefully of the landscape, and but the landscape itself is a measure zero subset of the space of quantum field theories. So here I'm going to review some of the proposed requirements for, for, the string, for a quantum field theory to be part of the string landscape. The first criteria turns out to be that the theory better have no global symmetries. 
So symmetries we have are a cherished principle of physics. So usually look for symmetries. This is surprising. It says that if your theory has a symmetry, it is no good. You have to throw it out. It's impossible to get that in, in, in the quantum theory of gravity. You can get approximate symmetries, but not exact symmetries. At least not exact global symmetries. The only symmetries that you can have in string theory are gauge symmetries, like electromagnetism and so forth. So those are okay. But global symmetries without relations to gate symmetries are not allowed. Second criteria is the uniqueness of quantum gravity. The quantum gravity is unique. All the different possible vacuum of string theory are all connected into one object. So it's kind of unification of all possible quantum, quantum gravity theories. This is called the cobordism conjecture. For a given gauge theory, if it appears, a gauge symmetry appears in, in gravity, all charges must appear in the spectrum. This is called the completeness hypothesis. If you have a field in your theory, like a scalar field, the range for that scalar field is effectively finite. It cannot be infinitely large. So there's a kind of a compactness to the field space. The theory admits light higher dimensional objects. So you cannot just have particles. You must have things like strings, or sometimes you might end up with membranes or other things. That's as, it, as we know in string theory. Gravity is always the weakest force. You might have other forces like electromagnetism and other kinds of forces, but in all consistent quantum field theories that arise in string theory, gravity is always the weakest. This is called the weak gravity conjecture. Restrictions on critical points of potentials, when the potential is positive and, and the cosmological implications are another facet of the Swampland program related to what are called the De Sitter conjectures, which I'll spend some time at, at the end of my talk. So, so what I'm going to do now is to go one by one, going over all of them in turn, from starting from number one, all the way to the number seven and give you examples or motivations of why we believe in these, in these requirements. So to do that, before I start that part, I just wanna point out one, uh, some basic facts about black holes. So if you fix a charge and a mass for black hole, suppose you have a big charge Q and a big mass M, then as long as the mass is bigger than the charge in Planck units I'm doing, then you can have a consistent solution to Einstein's equation. You get a consistent black hole. The extreme case where mass is equal to the charge can also occur. This is called the extreme of black hole. Black holes have thermodynamical properties, uh, thanks to the work of Wittgenstein and Hawking. In particular, they carry an entropy. Uh, the entropy of a black hole is not zero, even though the solution might be unique, which is unique, it's called the Noher theorem. Nevertheless, there's a degeneracy of the quantum theory of black holes, suggesting that the black holes carry an entropy proportional to the horizon area in Planck units. So if the area of the black hole is A, area of the horizon of the black hole is A, the entropy of the black hole is A over four in Planck units. So I now come to describe these swampland uh, criteria one by one. So how do we, why do we get these conditions? Where do these conditions arise from? The first one is that, as I mentioned, that there are no global symmetries. So to, to explain why this, is a, why this is a reasonable criteria, it is, we have, to, we have to do a Gedanken experiment, thought experiment, where we imagine having a black hole and imagine having a global charge Q, small Q, tiny global charge. Remember, by global charge, I mean charges which don't have, which are not coupled to any gauge fields. There's no electric fields emanating from it. So there's nothing emanating from this charge field, just a conserved charge. Suppose you throw it inside the black hole. After you throw it inside the black hole, uh, from outside, you wouldn't know that there's a charge inside because there's no electrical field coming out. And so therefore, as far as the black hole is concerned, the information about the charge is lost. You just have a massive black hole. According to the Bekenstein and Hawking, the black hole evaporates by Hawking radiation. 
And when it evaporates, the charge that you threw disappears with it. So therefore, you see that the act of black hole, black hole can kind of swallow the charge and make it disappear. And you might think, well, when the black hole is, is evaporating, maybe it spits out more of the charge from the opposite sign charge. But that can't be the case because the black hole pref does not prefer one charge over the other because there's no field emanating from it. So it spews out as many plus Q as, many, as, mu as much as minus Q. So the evaporation process is neutral with respect to the charge. And therefore at the end, at the beginning you have the charge Q and at the end you have no net charge. And therefore this leads to the global charge violation. And in other words, there is no global symmetries. The charge has been violated simply by the fact that black holes exist. So this is the first criteria. Indeed, all the examples in string theory, there are no global symmetries. The second feature is the uniqueness of quantum gravity. So this is the generalization of no global symmetries conjecture. If there were two different kinds of compactification of string theory, which you cannot couple, which, you, which were distinguishable, then you can associate the charge to them. And so the idea that you cannot be able to associate the charge means you cannot distinguish different vacuo from one another. So if you have a one compactification M and another one N, there must be a way to get from one to the other, from any one to any other one. So all the possible universes are within our, our fingertip. We should be able to go from one to the other. And this is called the cobordism conjecture. That means any two compactification of string theory and more broadly, any two consistent quantum gravities should be connected from one to the other by a physical process which involves finite action. The third criteria for the swamp plant I want to describe is that all charges of a, of a gauge theory appear in the spectrum. Suppose we have a U1 gauge symmetry. As I mentioned, gauge symmetries are allowed in a quantum gravity. So suppose you have a U1 gauge symmetry. And suppose uh, we ask what kind of charged particles can we get? In principle, all integral charges should, are allowed to exist, but do they actually, are they actually part of the spectrum of the theory? Can we get arbitrary charged objects? Without gravity, a priori, there is no such reason. For example, you can contemplate having a theory of pure U1 Maxwell theory with no charged states at all. So therefore, we don't have to have charged particles without gravity. But it turns out with gravity, this story changes. And indeed, as I will now argue, all the charges must appear in the theory. You cannot have, for example, a Maxwell theory with no charges. Indeed, if you have a U1 gauge theory, charge one, charge two, charge three, all the way to infinity should exist, including all the negative ones. How do we see that? Well, you consider a black hole of mass M and charge Q, which has an event horizon. As I mentioned, the area over four is the entropy of such a black hole, which means that the number of states which have a mass M and charge Q is given by N equals to exponential of the area of the horizon of the black hole in Planck units divided by four. And therefore it's not zero. That means for a given M and Q, as long as these are big and gives you a big black hole, there are such states in your theory. On the other hand, you can take a charge Q plus one black hole, and you can take a black hole of big charge, but minus Q. Again, it's a consistent black hole, and you collide them together. And when they collide together by conservation of electric charge, the net charge is plus one. So we can consider any charged object from this process, and therefore any charged object should be in the spectrum of the theory. So again, as you can see, black holes leads the way into what can be expected to happen. Criterion four is that the range for the fields is finite. This is also related to what is called the duality conjecture or the distance conjecture. Consider the scalar field phi. Without gravity, we usually have no restriction on its range. We usually take phi to be real, taking any value from minus infinity to plus infinity. 
However, with gravity, it seems the range of this field for a given effective theory cannot be any bigger than the Planck scale. So in other words, if you take an effective theory and you, you ignore massive states, then it turns out you cannot make this range of the scalar field any bigger than one in Planck units. If you try to make it bigger, if you try to go to infinity, what happens is that you get some of the states which are massive that you had ignored become light and become very light and you couldn't ignore it. So your effective field theory breaks down. So as soon as you go too far in field space, you find that your effective field theory is no longer applicable. So for every, any given effective field theory, there's only a finite range for the fields. So if you think about this, uh, the, the field space, the values that the field can have in general could be multi-dimensional space. It doesn't have just to have one field. It could have many fields. And there's a geometry. Namely, if you look at the kinetic term for these scalar fields, you get a kinetic term of this form in four dimensions, let's say. And the kinetic term defines a metric gij of phi as a function of phi. So it defines a metric on the field space in this form, the S squared being gi, j, d phi, i, d phi, j. So the thing I was saying is that if you, if you are within order one in this metric, in this distance, you're fine. But if you go too far away, you find that in the far away points, as you go towards infinity, there are different ways you can go to infinity. And each way you go to infinity, your theory breaks down and you get a dual descriptions. What happens is that as you go in large values of phi, you get a tower of light states which come down exponentially fast towards zero. So you get the tower of states whose mass go like e to the minus alpha phi as phi goes to infinity where alpha is order one in Planck units. So you get all this tower and what is the point of these towers? These light states give you a dual description of your theory, your theory breaks down. So there are different duality corners. Each one gives you a different description of the theory. So this is sometimes called the distance conjecture or the duality conjecture. That means when you go too far in field space, you always end up with a dual description of the theory. A potential application of the distance conjecture is that the cosmological constant can be viewed as a distance in field space. So it turns out that the correct way to parameterize the cosmological constant is in terms of exponential of a field. So with the current value of the cosmological constant, this corresponds to a value of a field of the order of 300, which should be viewed as tiny. And therefore, in some sense, we should expect a tower of light states, which go like e to the minus some constant of order one times phi, but the constant of order one times phi is the same as, that means that the mass should go like some power of the dark energy or the cosmological constant. For example, it's known that the mass of the neutrino is a dark energy to the one quarter. This is an observation from particle physics, which is surprising because you know, dark energy has en units of energy to the fourth. So it's one quarter as units of mass. And it's one of those remarkable relations that we don't have a deep understanding why, but it seems to fit nicely with the fact that mass of these elementary particles are some powers of this dark energy. So criteria four, five is that there are always extended objects in the theory of quantum gravity, like strings, which is one dimensional. By extended, I mean their dimension is not just zero like particles, but could be one dimensional like strings or two dimensional like membranes. This follows at least heuristically from the previous criterion I told you about, the fact that the range for the fields are finite. To see this, consider compactifying the theory on a circle of radius r. If you take a circle of radius r, r is equal to e to the phi, it turns out that in one lower dimensional theory, the Lagrangian is one half grad phi squared. And so therefore this phi parameterizes distance in the field space. So if you go to large values of phi, you expect from the distance conjecture to get a tower of light states. Large values of phi corresponds to large values of the radius. So if you take a bigger and bigger circles, we are expecting to get a light tower of particles. What are these light tower of particles? Well, if R is much, much bigger than one, the light tower of particles are just the Caluso-Klein modes. 
The Kaluza Klein modes are just the momentum modes around the circle. And these energies, which are quantizing units of one over R, which means goes like e to the minus phi, because R is e to the phi. And so the effective theory breaks down when you go to large values of R, because in some sense, the dimension, a new dimension opens up. And so that's what happens. However, we can also go the other way. Namely, we can go to phi much, much less than zero. That means that corresponds to the radius going to zero. The duality conjecture predicts something should become light because this is also infinite distance. So as you shrink the circle to zero size, something should become light. But this does not happen in particle theories. If you had just a theory of particles, when you shrink something to zero size, all the momentum modes freeze out because they have infinite mass. And the theory just becomes reduced, a reduction of the theory with the same field content, but restricted to zero momentum. So you don't get any new states. There's no tower of particles. That means the theory cannot just be the theory of particles. How can you get light states when the radius goes to zero? Because the distance conjecture predicts that there must be. The only natural mechanism for getting light states is if we have extended objects like strings or membranes. And the way this happens is that if you have a circle, you can wrap a string around it or a one of the legs of the membrane around it. And when you shrink it, the energy or the mass of that state goes to zero because the mass is proportional to the tension times the length. And as R goes to zero, that length is going to zero and therefore the mass goes to zero. So you get a tower of these states and these towers correspond to strings wound once, twice, three times, et cetera. So you get a tower of states this way. The criteria six is that gravity is the, always the weakest force. This is true in string compactifications. And it has been observed that, uh, that whenever we have charged particles, the electric force between them is always stronger than their gravitational attraction. So if you have two of these particles here, you have a gravitational attraction, which goes like m squared over r squared. And you have electric repulsion, which goes like e squared over r squared. And this red force, this electric force, is much stronger than the gravitational attraction. So if you have two of these charged particles, they always repel each other. So this is the statement that the gravity is weaker than electromagnetic force. So for example, for our universe, this is of course true that the mass of the electron in fundamental units is 10 to the minus 23. By fundamental units, I mean Planck units. And the electric charge of the electron is 10 to the minus one from the fine structure constant. And therefore, indeed, it's true that the mass is much less than the charge. So therefore, the gravitational force is very small compared to the electrical charge. So M is much less than E, and therefore Fg is much less than Fe. And this is true in our universe, as you can see, by a huge margin, namely this comparison between 10 to the minus 23, which is tiny number compared to the 0.1. So what is the explanation of this? This is just an observation, but is it true in all theories of gravity? Uh, the answer is yes, at least that's what we expect. And this is the, the, the motivation for it. You see, black hole offer an explanation of this weak gravity conjecture. So you start with a black hole, which, has, which is extremal. So you take a big mass and a big charge. So mass equals to charge. Now you emit a small charge and a small mass from the black hole because we said the black hole is gonna evaporate. When it evaporates, the charge of the black hole goes down to Q minus Q and the mass goes down to M minus M by the mass conservation and the charge conservation. However, I told you that for a consistent black hole, the, ma the mass should be bigger than the charge, and therefore this is less than or equal sign. But for this to be a less than or equal sign, that means this little charge that you have emitted should have bigger value than the mass. In other words, the mass that you have emitted should be less than its charge. In other words, you can have elementary states whose, whose, whose mass is less than their electric charge. The special case that mass equal to charge can only occur for supersymmetric cases, which are called BPS states. So this is the kind of a motivation for why weak gravity should be true in our universe. It's basically related to the 
evaporation of black holes. Since the black holes evaporate, if you start with the extreme of black hole, at least that's the conjecture we have, evaporation of the black holes implies that the gravity is always the weakest force. There are further evidences for weak gravity conjecture. Pure Maxwell theory coupled to Einstein's gravity leads to naked singularity. What is a naked singularity? Well, these are singularities that are not hidden behind the horizon, behind the horizon of a black hole where there are strong electrical fields. Weak gravity conjecture leads to avoiding it. So how does it work? Well, so because we have a gravity theory, if you have a U1 Maxwell theory, you know there cannot be, pure Maxwell theory cannot exist. Therefore, you must have charged states, as we mentioned already. Now, weak gravity says more. It says, okay, there are charged states, but more than that, their mass cannot be too high. At least, at least a few of them, the light elementary ones, should have mass less than their charge. So you have light charge states. When electrical field becomes strong, exactly when at the moment where they're going to create this naked singularity, it turns out that the electrical field is sufficiently strong to create these lights, since the mass is less than charge, it turns out that the electrical field can create these light states out of the vacuum and give rise to screening of the electrical field due to the creation of these charged states. And therefore gets rid of the electrical field and gets rid of the singularity and this is consistent with Penrose's cosmic censorship conjecture. So as you can see, there are deep relations between different aspects of string theory, weak gravity conjecture, cosmic censorship, and so forth. So it connects the whole idea together into one framework. So there's another application of the weak gravity conjecture to our universe. So let me explain that one. You see our universe, one of the important facts about our universe is that dark energy has been observed, cosmological constant, and it's not zero, it's positive. And it's almost constant and perhaps exactly constant. And this is what's called, it gives rise to what's called a de-sitter space. When you have a positive dark energy, the Einstein solution to space with a dark energy is a de-sitter space, which is an exponentially expanding space. Now, you could consider black holes in our universe in our universe. Well, there are, you can consider small black holes. By small, I mean here, even galactic sized black holes, the black holes which are the center of the galaxies, or huge black holes, black holes which are almost as big as the whole universe. The condition that they both evaporate give you different relations. The condition that small black holes should be able to evaporate implies that the mass of their, there should be elementary particles who, whose mass is less than the charge. However, the condition that big black holes, the size of the whole universe, should be able to decay also, implies that the mass of the electrically charged state cannot be too small. And it should be bigger than the dark energy to the one quarter times square root of Q. So for our universe, this implies that for the electron, the mass of the electron is less than 10 to the minus one, but bigger than 10 to the minus 31. And the mass of the electron is 10 to the minus 23. It's quite amusing that we can actually have a semi-quantitative bound on the mass of the electron. Well, it's not a very sharp bound, as you can see, because the range is wide, but still. I mean, if you think logarithmically about it, it's not too bad. You know, M, M is 10 to the minus 23, and it fits in this range. It's also interesting that the lower bound that you get on the mass of the electron in this way is very close to the mass of the neutrinos. So this 10 to the minus 31 is very much about the range that the masses of the neutrinos have. And perhaps there could be an explanation for why these are uh, the lightest states that nothing can be lighter than them. For the last set of topics, for the last set of criteria for swampland, I want to describe restrictions on the cases where potential is positive and more, more specifically on critical points of cases where we have positive energy. Interested in positive energy. Well, it turns out having a situation with positive energy is very useful for cosmology. For example, it's an important question for early cosmology in the context of inflation, where we typically take a model of this, 
this form, we take a potential phi, sometimes called the inflaton field, with some potential V, and we consider a situation where the potential is relatively fat, a large region of fat potential, and some region where the potential kind of drops down into a minimum, and the minimum of it could be what the value of the dark energy is today, for instance. Now, what can we say about situations like this when you have positive potential like this? It turns out for string theory, this is a very difficult problem. The reason is that for such cases, whenever the potential is positive, you necessarily must break supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is inconsistent with having potential being positive. So if you have a supersymmetry in the fundamental theory like string theory has, it must be that you're dealing with a vacuum which breaks it if you deal with this kind of situation. And typically when you get break supersymmetry, most of what we can say in string theory becomes difficult except when you go to weak coupling points in string theory. So there are some regions which you still can say something, but bulk, bulk, bulk of it, we cannot say much. So the only regions we can say something is like, like the following. When you go to these large distances in field space, this is the field space I talked about before. When you go far in the distance and field space, these turn out to be describing locally weak description, weak coupling descriptions of the string theory. And so in these weak coupling points, we can compute the potentials. And what we find is that the potentials in these cases turn out to be exponentially fast decay towards zero. So all the potentials seem to die as you go to weak coupling points in this way. This is from observation of string compactifications. So typically we find that the potentials go like e to the minus c phi for large value of phi. In fact, more than that, it turns out that the slope of the potential, namely if you take the derivative of the potential with respect to phi divided by the, by the potential, which in this case, it means the value of the C is bigger than or equal to square root of two thirds for all known examples that we know in string theory for large values of phi. So that means not only it goes to zero, it goes to zero relatively fast of order one in exponential. So what can we say? Well, if we want to have a situation like our universe, we would look for the positive energy, which is relatively constant. So you might look for a minimum of a potential with a positive value for the V, what we call the dissiter space. If it was negative, it's what we call anti-dissiter. But we want to be here because we know that the dark energy in our universe is positive. Now, Already from this fact, the fact that the potential goes to zero at infinity, no matter how small this value is, you learn that it cannot be stable because you can always tunnel far enough into field space to end up with potential smaller. So in other words, no model of dark energy in string theory is stable. So therefore we can predict if string theory is correct, that our universe cannot be exactly stable. At best, it's metastable. Namely, at best, if you are at the minimum or, 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 uh, or local minimum here, you'll be able to tunnel and go far away in field space and lower your energy. So your universe is not stable. We are not sure if metastable desiderate exists either. We do not know if these are allowed to construct these. And the problem here is that you need to get to the, not just the far regions in field space, but you need to get to the middle of the field space. And these are hard to do because the coupling constants of string theory are not small in the middle. So we do not have analytic controls unlike the supersymmetric case where we could say something even in this region for non-supersymmetric cases, we cannot say much about inside this region. And therefore the study of what happens or whether or not these, you have these kinds of situations is very difficult in string theory. And we are not sure if there are metastable vacuum and string theory or not, like the one I'm showing you. So the question is, so what, what can we say from the inside in the middle? What can we say about the potential? So a desiderate swampland constraint at large field values. In this case, I said that large field values, V prime is much bigger than some constant times V. And this can be explained by saying that at large distances, there's a tower of states which go like e to the minus constant times phi, 
And if the potential picks up a correction like m to the fourth, which is natural, you automatically get something v, which is exponentially goes to zero. So that's a very natural conjecture for large distance. But what goes on in the middle is more mysterious. There are three possibilities considered so far for what happens for the potential inside the field space when you're away from the weak coupling points. One possibility is that there are no restrictions. This is unnatural uh, because the boundaries, you have very specific restrictions, the potentials go to zero. So no restriction is a bit strange inside. The other two possibilities are some swampland conditions that have been proposed. The first one is the De Sitter swampland conjecture, which says that either V is sufficiently unstable. So if, the, if you have a minimal, if you have a critical point of V, it better be an unstable critical point with the instability sufficiently strong compared to the V. In other words, V double prime over V, v is sufficiently less than order one number. C and C prime here are order one. Or it could be that if it's not stable, if it's not unstable uh, potential, you could have a situation where V prime is just going like constant times V for some C. The second conjecture is what's called the Transplankian censorship conjecture. The Transplankian censorship conjecture is motivated by the assumption that if you have a mode which are smaller than the Planck scale, subplankian, the expansion ex and expanding universe cannot push that subplankian mode to become bigger than the size of the universe. In other words, if you start with an initial radius of the universe, A initial, and you go to the final size of the universe, this magnifies the Planck scale to its given size. And this should never be bigger than the size of the universe, which is given by the Hubble scale at the final value, which is one over HF. It turns out if you make just this assumption, you automatically deduce that the potential slope for large distances are bigger than square root of two thirds, which is a fact known to string theory. So this, this leads to one of the predictions that we have seen in string models, that the slope is actually uh, bigger than V by square root of two thirds. And that's a kind of a, an explanation of it that Transplankian censorship conjecture uh, leads to this prediction. So you might ask, what are some of the relation between swampland and inflation? Inflation idea is not ruled out in typical scenarios, but it seems to be highly fine-tuned. The duality conjecture leads to prediction that we cannot have naturally arbitrary large field inflation. Because if you, go, you need a typically a large field space, and if you go in large field space, you get tower of light states, and these tower of light states, as the field is, as the inflaton is moving on the potential, get created and they destroy the inflation. And uh, so this, is, this seems a bit unnatural. The second problem is that uh, the slope uh, is a problem because uh, the slope, uh, you, need, you need a relatively sm uh, small slope in the, in the inflation model, C less than 0 0.02, and this leads to rather small numbers. And finally, if you use the transplantian censorship conjecture that I mentioned, you find that the value of the potential at the minimum should be 10 to the nine GV, sorry, the, the value of the potential at the height value when, when, the, when the inflation happens is less than 10 to the nine GV to the fourth. And this gives you a very fine tuned inflation where epsilon, the, the uh, slow row parameter is really tiny, 10 to the minus 31. And the, this tensor mode coefficient R is 10 to the minus 30. So these are highly small and highly fine tuned. And it makes the initial value problem in inflation much harder to solve. And this basically means inflation doesn't happen. So this, these, are, these are inconsistent with inflation in a sense. Now you might ask, okay, if inflation is a problem, then what is the beginning of the universe like? Well, the puzzles of early universe turns out that they arise after one makes one major assumption, which inflation tries to solve. And the assumption is that, that's, and that assumption is inconsistent with string dualities. You see, the main assumption that you make when you try to extrapolate, you take our universe, you extrapolate it back to early universe time, but you're assuming Einstein's theory is still valid. That is very unnatural because as we go to a extremely small space, this is a large distance and field space and you expect the tower of light states to come. For example, when you go, when you consider extreme limits in string theory, like large infinite temperature, 
That's what happens if you take Big Bang literally go back in time. Temperature gets bigger and bigger and the radius gets smaller and smaller. And as I mentioned, these are both a situation where you expect the tower of light states to emerge. For example, you can think about the temperature in terms of the inverse radius in Euclidean space. And so this both correspond to smaller and smaller spaces in some form. And therefore we expect that the theory breaks down. So the Einstein theory is not applicable. So many of the puzzles of early universe that we have like horizon problem and all that are related to assuming Einstein's theory valid all the way down. And then you try to solve it with inflation. But here, string theory is telling you, no, 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 you shouldn't do that. The whole theory breaks down and you have a new degree of freedom taking over. So it's much more, much more uh, radical change than departure than just adding one scalar field. The whole, there, there should be a whole new description of the physics. So what do these swamp land conditions, conjectures I mentioned, what do they predict about the present and the future? Well, if we assume that this is a swamp land conjecture, we can only be in a situation where the potential is rolling because you cannot have a metastable dissenter. In that case, after a while of rolling, you end up getting a tower of light states and it gives rise to a phase transition. And given the parameters of our universe, you can use fit the model to our observations and you find that the, the life the time scale for such a transition is less than about 30 Hubble time. <coughs> that means we have 30 times more of the uh, life of the universe left over. If you assume trans censorship conjecture instead, you find that our metal, and if you assume, for example, we are in the metal stable the sitter, you find the lifetime of that cannot be too long. And it should be less than 2 trillion years. So we have like 14 billion years now, we have another factor of 100 to go <coughs> at, at most. <clears throat> Either of these conjectures explain one version of the coincidence problem of why the time scale associated to the measured value of the dark energy is close to the current age of the universe. In other words, if you take the dark energy, there's a natural time scale associated with it, which is one over root lambda. This time scale turns out to be very close to the current lifetime of the universe. And the question is why? Is it accidental or what? Well, the claim here is that these, this conjecture implies this is not accidental. In any universe where you are about to measure the dark energy, the dark energy is the major part of that universe. And therefore the full lifetime of that universe is not too far away from that scale. And therefore the lifetime is related to one over root lambda. So a typical time scale you sample in that universe is gonna be close to one over root lambda. So this is not an accidental fact. Let me conclude by saying that swampland conditions can lead to potentially observable consequences for particle physics and cosmology. Almost all quantum field theories are in the swampland. Therefore, fine tuning such as hierarchy problem for particle physics may end up having a totally different solution when you include gravity in the mix. This leads to severe restriction on consistent theories of quantum gravity. These also suggest that there are tight restrictions on what are the light matter fields. Moreover, positive energy in the context of quantum gravity lead to local and global instabilities. This may explain the coincidence problem that I mentioned before. New ideas such as dualities of string theory are expected to play a key role for early universe. Thank you. So thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Vafa, for this excellent, I mean, presentation. I thank mean, you. you cover a lot of uh, things. I mean, you mentioned uh, what's the motivations and uh, the conditions or the conjectures of the swamp land. And after that, the applications in, uh, I mean, particle physics and cosmology. So I think uh, we're gonna start with um, some questions from the audience and uh, maybe we start with the professors and after that we take the public. So please, um, if you have any questions right now, uh, by the way, professor, if you allow me, because uh, I mean, it is a good opportunity with the public maybe if they want to ask, uh, general questions, I mean, uh, other than swampland, is it allowed or? 
Yes, yes. I, I first of all, let me explain. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mohammed. I would be happy to uh, respond to questions not specifically about the talk I gave, more generally about physics or science if I can answer it. Uh, please, please feel free to ask it. Uh, don't feel restricted to the topic we just covered. Secondly, I would be happy uh, to see your faces, given you know uh, I don't have the pleasure of seeing you in person. I might as well. By the way, uh, Ashtikar, he asked the same. Uh, I mean, favor that the guy who asked him, he need to open the camera. Yes, I love to see people's faces. So please do open the cameras if you don't mind. I love to see your faces uh, and. Um, if you are in a situation where you prefer not to, that I understand. But if you can, I'll be happy to see your faces, regardless of if you're asking questions or not. So you don't, you don't have please to- Please increase the interactivity with the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, even if you're not asking questions, please feel free. I'd love to see faces. The more the faces, the happier I'll, I'll be. At any no, rate, no. Uh, if you want to ask questions, please uh, please feel free to ask it by unmuting and, uh, and Mohammed will direct or Ahmed will direct you. Okay. So we'll start with the- uh, questions from audience who want to ask by voice. Uh, Professor Vava, thank you very much for this vivid and eloquent presentation. Thank you. Indeed, I, uh, I have listened to many uh, people who talk in this, uh, on this subject, although I am not a string theorist, but I, I learn or I try to learn. Uh, and uh, this is one of the very rare equations where I could understand 90%. Thank you. I'm happy to uh, for, so thank you very much indeed. Uh, as far as my comments are concerned, it's very, very limited, actually. I, I am uh, originally uh, worked on quantum field theory in curved space-time in the mid-70s, you know, that was in fashion. And we have uh, considered the Einstein universe as a toy model. Uh, for employing some sort of uh, combination of quantum mechanics or quantum field theory in curved space time. So we consider the background as mm -hmm. a classical described by the general theory of relativity and the metric, mm -hmm. while the uh, uh, right hand side of the Einstein equation we take as the vacuum expectation value mm -hmm. of, of the matter fields spinner fields or scalar field or whatever. Right. Uh, surprisingly enough, we found that with our toy model, for example, two uh, points, which I, two, two uh, point that you mentioned. One, as A goes to zero, T goes to infinity. In our model, it doesn't. Actually, first of all, the, uh, the, uh, uh, Quantum effects prevent anything called A goes to zero. It won't go to zero, it goes to blank size. But at the blank size, we found that the result obtained from our calculation that the temperature becomes one unit, which is 10 to the power 32 Kelvin, which agrees exactly with, the, with agrees to large extent with what, what particle physicists expect. Second, as far as tau goes to, goes like one over square root of lambda, again, we, <laughs> we got such a relation in our Einstein toy model, Einstein universe model, where if you, where we, we get lambda actually proportional to one over a square. So if you have the a corresponding to t, then therefore we can, because c is one in, in our units. We always deal with, with the absolute units. So tau will be exactly one, goes like one over uh, uh, square root of lambda. That's why uh, more recently in the last few years, uh, one of my students uh, considered the same Einstein model, but as he put it, he, 
he put in this in this static Einstein model a motor, which which generates several Einstein models, one after the our universes. You can generate several Einstein mo uh, universes uh, in successive fashion to see if uh, resembles it resembles the the uh, universe, the existing universe, the real universe. And indeed, there were many, many implications which shows that it does indeed. Uh, uh, we don't have any inflation in, uh, in our model. There is no inflation. We don't need inflation, in fact. And our model is similar to the standard Big, big Bang, less, less the, the standard problems associated with the with the Big Bang, including the monopole problem, the existence of monopole, why, why, why there is no monopole. But unfortunately, our model contains a uh, uh, very, very slow, uh, continuous creation of matter. So my question, Professor Vava, you are obviously famous strength theorist, and why, why, uh, why do, don't we consider again the uh, simpler approach of uh, the semi-classical approach in quantum field theory curve space-time. Well, there are. I, I'm not familiar specifically with the model you're mentioning. People have considered uh, people. I mean, in, in physics, you always look for simplest model. You don't look for harder. Getting a harder model is no is no uh, achievement. You try to get the simpler model every time. So the problem has been in the context of uh, field theory and Einstein's theory, there are roadblocks into doing that. Now, if you want to include quantum effects only for field theory, that doesn't do justice to the uh, quantum nature of gravity itself. We cannot view gravity as a background because gravity certainly, as you said, when you get to Planck scale, you cannot assume gravity is just a background. So certainly that's an inadequate description also. So, uh, precisely when you include gravitational issues, you will find in the context of string theory that story changes dramatically when you get to radii which are Planck length. So in the case of the Planck length, what happens is that you find there are towers of light states. So, they're so it's not like we want to get complication, it's just they come there. Uh, so therefore, all I'm trying to say is that it's not like people don't try to find a simpler model, they love simpler model but the simpler models have to be consistent with other things that we do know, and that doesn't seem to be the case. So, so therefore that's why people introduce inflation. And then I've tried to explain why inflation has issues with string theory. There are still some people within string theory that hope inflation can be realized. They're trying to make models from within string theory to accommodate inflation. But I myself believe that most likely the issue is gonna be a totally different description and a more radical view of the early universe. Not because I like complication, of course not, but it's the way it seems like it's most natural in string theory. Hmm. Thanks for the comment, nevertheless. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, and thank you, yeah. Professor Basil. We have a question. We will make a balance between verbal and written questions. So we took one verbal, now we will take a written question. Uh, we have a question. Is the standard model is enough to be sure for now? from Dr. Said Saba, and by the way, Dr. Said Saba is a professor of nuclear physics. Uh, professor Said, if you can open the mic and join us, it would be great. So, so is the standard model enough, Professor Cameron? Sir, what does it mean to be enough? Maybe I'm not understanding the question exactly. Do you follow what the question exactly is? What is written is, is the standard model is enough to be sure for now? What does that mean? What does that mean? So if, if the question is whether the standard model fits with the observation of the, in the Large Hadron Collider and the colliders in general, the answer is yes. We seem to, every aspect of the collider physics seems to fit with standard model. Is it mm -hmm. adequate? No, it's not adequate because we do know gravity should be part of it. So standard model doesn't talk about gravity. So if by standard model, we mean adding gravity to the mix, we know that naively, if you just take the standard model and ask graviton into the mix, you get infinity. So there should be some other things around. So, mm -hmm. so the answer is that if you, by standard model, you mean including gravity, then we know there should be other stuff. Okay, thank you, Professor. We have a question from uh, Mr. Mohammed Haj Yusuf. Okay. Yes, please. 
We cannot hear you, Mr. Muhammad. Uh, okay. uh, for do you have questions? I mean, from the audience, because yes. I think here. Yes. yes, we have some of questions. But this Muhammad, uh, Mr. Hajj Yusuf had his hand up for a long time. Yes. I think he could, he could ask the uh, question if he wishes, but I think yes. that he was mute. We cannot hear him. If we can unmute you. Is he, can he, we cannot hear you. He is unmuted, but we cannot hear. There is a problem with your microphone, Mr. Muhammad. Maybe the earphone that you are using are not working. We cannot hear you. So uh, let me pass to another person and then we come back to you when you solve the problem. Uh, by you the way, question? Uh, yes, Dr. Akram. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Ah. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand so we can set uh, questions in a queue. We have a question from Mr. Youssef Abdul Muhaymin. Mr. Youssef? Yes. Yes, we can hear. Uh, uh, I am asking about uh, information loss in uh, black hole. What is string theory explanation for this? Uh, well, uh, explanation of the string theory is that the black hole is given by microstates. Like we understand this entropy, uh, we, we understand that naively you might start with one degree of freedom, like a big blob black hole, but that's not the case. There are these microstates, which are fuzzy descriptions, which are, which are those details of the black hole at the scale of Planck hidden. So you can see it. And you might think that they're all the same black hole, but that's not the case. So in other words, you can distinguish a given microstate from the given states that you have. So the, the entropy of the black hole is not zero, but it's given by area over four. And the area over four means that somehow the, the information is there in terms of microstate degrees of freedom somehow encapsulated at the horizon. But this is the general expectation because of the fact that the entropy of the black holes we have been able to explain within string theory, but the detailed mechanism of how the information puzzle resolves and what is the exact description from within string theory in terms of microscopically, how does it fit in detail as the evaporation proceeds has not been, has not been in general uh, elucidated. Thank you, Professor. We have a question from Mr. Salahuddin Kumrani. He said that according to physicists, there's a problem with string theory that it says there is maybe 10 to the power 500 universes. So, and each universe has its own uh, laws of physics. So how can we explain that we are in this universe? Well, this is certainly one of the big issues in string theory. We have, I said the landscape is finite. And I, I, when I say the landscape is small, I mean compared to infinity is small. But 10 mm -hmm. to the 500 is, doesn't sound like a small number, but it's small compared to infinity. 10 to the 500 over infinite is zero. So, so that's the sense in which the numbers are small. But this is a valid question about, okay, so which one is our universe? The main point is that our universe should in some sense be very highly fine-tuned. If you have, for example, a plane, and if you pick a point in it, it's not going to be a totally random point. That means that almost all the points are not allowed. Even if there are 10 to the 500 points on the plane, they're just points. They're very specific points that you can get. So, so these are questions. So the question is then, what do you do if you have huge number of possibilities? What can we say? Well, you could find correlations between facts. For example, I told you, for example, the mass of the electron is bounded by A and B. I gave you two numbers there. Well, that should be true for all those 10 to the 500 ones. So there are some basic facts which apply to all of them. So we have to understand those kind of universality conditions. What are universal features that quantum gravity predicts for all consistent quantum field theories that can couple to gravity? And therefore we can make such predictions. It may be that we cannot get every aspect of the universe predicted, but at least we can hope to explain some of it. Professor, I think for the previous questions of uh, the Black holes loss information. I think the guy he means uh, the works of the Ahmed and Mihiri and his group. I mean, and the Rio Takinagi uh, uh, entropy. I don't know if you are familiar with this. Uh, yes, I'm familiar with this, but that that is in the context of not. So, in the context of string theory, we do expect that there will be a resolution. For example, in the holographic realizations, 
mm-hmm. of, uh, of black holes, we do know that the boundary theory is unitary and therefore the information loss should be somehow resolved. But from describing it from the macroscopic viewpoint, we do not have a clear explanation. There are some recent explanation in the context of the island program for, for computations of the, of the entanglement of the information that this has been, uh, has, uh, has gave, gave rise to some qualitative explanation of this, for example, a bit deeper understanding of the page curve. But I would still say that we don't have a quite clear explanation of the unitarity of the black hole from this perspective. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mohammed? Yes, Dr. Akram. Yes, uh, because I want if there is any comments or uh, questions from Professor Saidi also because... Okay, uh, sure. Yes. Yes, Professor Saidi. Professor Saidi, if you have any uh, comments or uh, questions, I am happy also to hear from you. I thank you very much, Komarun, for thank your you. impressive talk. Uh, I would like to ask you about the criteria you describe it with regards to supersymmetry, conformal invariance, and topology, if you can say a few words. Sorry, about what aspect, topological symmetry? Su- supersymmetry, I mean, the supersymmetry in, in the picture, in the full picture. Yes. And also about conformal invariance. Of the worksheet, you mean? Yeah. Okay. No, uh, the, the, uh, conformal invariance in the QFT. Okay, so uh, okay, so I can say a few things. First of all, um, string theory seems to, at some high en- high enough energies, seem to be uh, the only stable solutions we know. Of string theory involves supersymmetry. And the only macroscopic large scale stable situations string theory are supersymmetric. So that's one basic fact. Now, in studying string theory, we have learned that in addition to gravity and all that, which is part of string theory, you could also have defects, lower dimensional defects, which support matter on the subspace smaller than the space time mm-hmm. dimension. Or they could be supported on the singularities of geometry. These give rise to supersymmetric systems on the subspaces, which can, in fact, in many cases, be conformal. So you can lead, so these kind of pictures have led to supersymmetric conformal field theories uh, that we did not know about for, for many of them. And in particular, we learned that there are theories in six dimension which have supersymmetry and conformal invariance, as well as theories in five and lower dimensions, so six, five, four, and so on. And we learned about not only some of the old things we had learned about supersymmetric theories in four dimensions, let's say, but we discovered new features by realizing these four, five, and six dimensional systems embedded in the 10 dimensional string theory or 11 dimensional M theory. So we learned something about this totality. So, so those are the cases where we have the maximal amount of information in string theory, where we have supersymmetry and where we can understand aspects of it based on stability and, uh, and the properties of supersymmetry algebra. Maybe also a few words about the classification of conformal, superconformal theories in six, five dimensions with regards to four dimensions and lower. Yes, we, we, we have, we have a, uh, there's a classification program already suggested in six dimension, which we seem to have two kinds of supersymmetric conformal theories. Those were two comma zero, and they seem to be classified by ADE, then before all the simply, there's a one-to-one correspondence between between, uh, ADE groups, but that's not in the sense of gate symmetry. So there's an ADE classification of two comma zero theories in six dimension, but there are also one comma zero superconformal field theories in six dimensions, and they turn out to be in one-to-one correspondence with singularities of elliptic threefolds elliptic Calabia threefolds in the context of the F-theory description. So those give rise to a beautiful set of examples and people have studied various new setups of these theories. So the first type have 16 supercharges, two comma zero theories, and the second have eight supercharges. These are the one comma zero theories. In five dimensions, people have also studied, there's, it's not, we don't have as much a classification, but we have a, a beginnings of a classification program for 5D as well where we studied some interesting gauge groups that can appear at infinite coupling, giving rise to superconformal field theories. In four dimension, we have recovered many of the old 
things that we knew about superconformal field theories, for example, we're using gauge theories, but also we have discovered new things. For example, we have discovered that you can compactify these theories from six dimension down to five and then to four and so on, and get a collection of the new conformal field theories as well as the old ones by doing compactification on three mount surfaces or three dimensions to three dimensions and so on. So this relation between six dimensions and lower dimensions can be done by compactification on, on the spaces, circles, surfaces on 3D and 4D and so on. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. We have a question from Mr. Fadi Masroud. Gravity is the weakest force in the same time. It is affecting the whole universe, movement and balance. Is the high scale distance uh, of the universe can explain the weakened, maybe weakness, of a gravity as it expands on the universe scale? Um, well, the fact that the gravity is the weak, is, is this Im most important force at large distances is because the other forces are so strong that they, they, they screen each other. So you don't have plus charges, neutralizes, minus charges, they screen each other. So you get net neutrality almost everywhere. So that's why, of course, we get gravity, even though it's weakest force, it's the most important force at large distances. That's the reason. Now, uh, the relation between the scale of the large scale structure of the universe and the weakness of gravity is not obvious. Why do we have a large universe and the gravity being the weakest force is not clear? Mm -hmm. uh, professor, Thank you, uh, professor. I think I have the questions, uh, if you allow me. Sorry, Dr. Akram, could you please? I have a question for Professor Vata. Uh, professor, yes. for, um, concerning uh, one of the motivation, I think before you, I mean, I don't know if there is um, other one thinking about these conjectures or these conditions, but I am just can, uh, asking for the motivation, uh, I mean, uh, for putting this kind of condition, especially I, uh, if you have, uh, I mean, one of the things which uh, come into my mind, if you think about the compactif uh, compactifications of, um, uh, I mean, super strings, I mean, in specific, for example, or uh, the consistent quantum gravities in specific dimension, I mean, we have a finite uh, number uh, of this. So we have a finite, like, for example, the Calabio, we have finite of those. But for example, the ADS-CFT correspondence, when we said, I mean, as you discussed in one of your lectures, yes. we don't have an ADS, I mean, correspondence, but we have an ADS cross and manifold, yes. I mean, it goes to CFT. So when we have infinite of those. So yes. um, do you think that this one of your motivations, I mean, between this contradiction between finites of compactification or the numbers of those Calabio and infinite, I mean, uh, ADS? Is it one so, of the motivations, I mean, to put those conjectures? Well, the conjectures also apply to ADS. So let me explain how that works. So, right. so, um, so let me first of all uh, re rephrase the question. Hmm. So in string theory, for example, 10 dimensional string theory, you can have subspaces which we have uh, various objects or brains or uh, defects located. For example, in type 2B string theory in 10 dimensions, we have four dimensional space time defects called D3 brains. And you can put D3 brains one, two, three, four, or any number, let's say parallel to each other, and they're perfectly stable and supersymmetric and nice. And indeed, on their subs, on, if you take N of them and put them next to each other, they give rise to a, a SUN gauge theory on four dimension in that subspace for any N. So there are infinitely many Ns you can pick. And so even though there's only one string theory type to be in 10 dimensions, you can have infinitely many defects. So when I say the th theory is unique, it doesn't mean there are unique objects in it. There are many objects you can put. You can put any N of the three brains. Now, these different ends lead to an ADS description if you go to the near horizon geometry. If you zoom in to these D brains, then this looks like ADS five times S five. And then you can get any ADS five times S five for any end, the different size of the uh, curvature. So if you take N larger and larger, the curvature of ADS becomes smaller and smaller. The ADS radius becomes bigger and bigger. 
and therefore it's consistent for infinitely many ADSs. However, for, uh, for you mean for the first manifold, imagine that you have ADS cross some manifold yes, and yes. cross something others. Yes, I, I'm going to say I'm going to say in a second. So okay. in this example I just told you, ADS can be R for R pre n exists, but then when you take n and n large, ADS five times S five becomes R ten, because S five and R five S five the compact part also grows. It's not just ADS five which grows. And therefore, you just get a unique 10 dimensional theory. So, even though you're, you seem to be indexing by an n, it is just the same way as indexing of an n dimensional nd3 brains in 10 dimensional space. So, you only have one theory in that case. Now, in the more general example where you have ADS times A times B, it could be that ADS times, you can, it could be that you can make A fixed size, but when you make ADS big, at least B will have to grow. There's something like a B another part of the system which has to grow in such a way that when it grows to become R6 or R7 or whatever, A times that extra space is a unique theory for all of those classes or a finite number of choices. So the main point is that when you go to the decompactification limit of ADS, you should only get finite number of possibilities. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, sure. Just last thing, I mean, when you have uh, what's called the uh, before your conjecture, I mean, all people have, for example, for the massless mode in supersymmetry is depending on the dimension and the n. So uh, is it, I mean, when you come up with those uh, conjectures, I mean, do you, um, uh, I mean, add some like a proof or something or still this is like just a conjecture? I'm not sure exactly which, which specific one you're referring to. The you're massless, talking about the number. The massless mode, I mean, depends on the dimension and the uh, uh, supersymmetric charge. And yes. So we, we don't have, I mean, so for supersymmetric ones, we do have a more analytic control, both from the swampland perspective and also from construction perspective. The higher the supersymmetry, the more restrictive it is. So it's more natural to try to understand the higher supersymmetric cases first with larger ends. When you study those, you find that many of the features of what you can get from string compactifications can be explained by those simple swampland conditions I mentioned on some, extra, ex, some extensions of it I haven't mentioned. So basically, we have a more under, better understanding for larger values of n. When supersymmetry is reduced to n equals to, for example, two or n equals to one in four dimensions, things become harder and we have less things to say. Of course, we are interested in being able to say for arbitrary n what the restrictions are so that you can have stratify the swampland condition based on n or for, for no n at all. Thank you, Professor. Do you have any more questions, uh, Dr. Akram? Dr. Akram, are you with us? Okay, before taking the next question, I would like to mention that this lecture is recorded and we'll share you with the link with uh, YouTube uh, recording for this lecture by your emails. And you can uh, watch it on our Facebook page, on uh, our YouTube channel also. Uh, this is to answer the question of someone who asked to record this uh, lecture. He's already recorded, actually. So next question from Mr. Mustafa Musadar. Yes, please. Uh Thank you, sir, for this presentation. So I have a question about uh, the lambda or uh, the cost molecular constant. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, some, uh, we know that uh, there is uh, some uh, article where uh, we have the two possible effects of the cosmological constants and maximally spaced on vacuum. Uh, we, we have a vacuum. And the next uh, question is about the reason where we compare the reason of uh, space time. Uh, I mean that uh, the reason of uh, the universe of holographic principle and that of uh, the black hole. So I'm not so, sure. Uh, I and, uh, I, I'm not you sure. Know, I got your question actually. The first one either. So the is first about, is yes. Is yes. about so the your first question. The first question is about the we have 
uh, and Einstein goes born is uh, gravity or black hole, we have two possible effects of cosmological constants. Why we have two? We have two, what do you mean by two, which two? Two cosmological constants and uh, if uh, Einstein goes born is gravity. And so what? Cosmological constant? Yes, yes. We have Ahmed, do you have to follow the question, Ahmed, constant. if you can? Do you follow no. the question, Ahmed? Not sure. Uh, uh, Mr. Mustafa. Maximally space time. We have... Mr. Mustafa, yes. your voice was not clear. So could you please temporarily close your okay. camera? Then we can hear you better. After that, you can open the camera again. Uh, please quickly repeat so your question. You can hear me now? Yes. You can hear me now? That's true. Yes. So, we, and, uh, and Einstein goes by to black hole gravity. Where we have two possible effects of cosmological constant. I was, I'm not understanding the question. Do, do you understand, Ahmed, the question? No, he asking about the cosmological constant, and we have, it seems like, two possibilities for Einstein model. This is what I You got. mean the sign of lambda? You mean positive and negative? Is that what you mean? Yes. Mm. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so there's two possibilities, positive and negative. The negative ones are typically, we understand better, especially when they are supersymmetric. They give rise to the examples where they are ADS, and many of the examples for holography that we know of are all related to negative value of lambda. So those are good cases, typically. Positive lambda is the hard case, and that's the case where we unfortunately don't know much, but that turns out to be the more important one for our universe. So therefore, the more interesting ones is the one that we have to learn more, but we know least amount about it in the context of string theory. Mm -hmm. So, so way we have uh, we use it, the bubbling uh, vata on this geometry. Sorry, what? I didn't quite catch. Sorry, Mr. Mustafa, what? but we cannot hear you properly. So maybe next time I can. So come thank back you. To you. Thank uh, you. Thank you for your sharing ideas. Uh, we have a question from Mr. Muhammad Haj Yusuf. He have he has two questions. Question one uh, is how it is possible to quantize gravity in string theory when it is still considered space time as continuous background? And the second question is the usual question what are the strings made of? Well, the, you, can, you can consider uh, fluctuations. So, what, what is a graviton? Take any curved geometry fluctuations of that geometry are ripples. And those ripples are what we mean by graviton. So you can quantize those classical waves in that background. And those give you what we call gravitons in that geometry. So each geometry will have different features. The graviton will have different features in different backgrounds. So there's nothing special about it. You can also do that like in photons. If you have a electromagnetic, for example, background, you can talk about quantizing of the photon in that background and you get a different property of photon if you have different backgrounds. If it's not vacuum, for example, you have different kind of propagation and so forth for photons. Also, I think he mean by the, I mean, in the context of string theory, the quantization of closed strings, I mean, and the excitations uh, give you, I mean, the spectrum of these closed strings, I mean, give you uh, what's called the gravitons. Right. So, so in the case of string theory, it's still magical why we get out of strings a graviton. We don't have a deep understanding of it. This is one of those magical features. Why should a one-dimensional object have anything to do with gravity? We don't have a good answer. These are good questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor. We have a question from Mr. Hussain Khaldi. Welcome, welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, Hussein, if uh, you, you can open the camera, I think Professor, he asked uh, anyone for... If, if he, he wants, wants, if he wants. If he doesn't want, that's fine. Up to him. Yeah. Up to uh, please, uh, what are the basic ideas of uh, string theory? What are the best ideas? What are the basic ideas of string theory? Basic ideas. ideas. I wish... Uh, good question. This is... This is a good question. You always should ask, what are the basic ideas? What are the fundamental principles? I wish I had a good answer to that question. Unfortunately, I don't. But this is the kind of thing we usually like to ask people. Like if you ask like Maxwell's theory, you said, okay, what are the Maxwell's equations? You write it down and you're done. You just go after that, you go applications. 
string theory is unfortunately, it's not at that stage of development. We have learned a huge amount about quantum gravity, but still we have to learn quite a bit more. We still do not know what string theory is a theory of. Mm -hmm. We know it's not a theory of strings. We know this string theory does have strings in them, but it's not just about strings. So it's more than that. And we don't have a deep understanding of what it is. Professor, yesterday, uh, I, I mean, the, um, I gave a talk and Professor also Bessert I was with me, I mean, with interaction about uh, the nature of time. And even with Knight and Seiberg, he discussed about the emergence of space-time in string theory. He said that um, he, um, we, know, we all know that space is emergent, but time, I mean, for now, I mean, he thinks also is emergent from something, what he said, from something sophisticated, uh, which he didn't know. So do you think in case uh, in the Swampland program, uh, can we, I mean, in the future answer um, this, uh, I mean, fundamental questions about the emergence of space-time? Well, I think that uh, I, I would say that the relations between space and other things, which uh, you could call emergent, it is, we do know that they kind of translate to each other. The nature of duality means something which appears like space to one perspective from a dual perspective is something else. So this should also be true about time. Something which appears to be somebody's time is somebody else's something else. That's something else we haven't understood. So duality in the context of time, we do not have good examples. And that's what uh, Nati is referring to. So indeed, we, we think there should be similar dualities which should relate to time, but we do not have a we do not have clear examples of that. Thank you, Professor. We have a question from Sir Karim Muhammad. Yes, please. Uh, hello, can hello. you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Vafa for uh, this kind of symposium, which inspired me uh, uh, and uh, get me aware of many issues that are interesting and that are on the frontiers of the current research in physics. Um, I am a second uh, year physics undergraduate student at Zouil City of Science and Technology in Egypt. Yes. And uh, I hope that all of the senior uh, researchers and professors be tolerant and indulgent with me as my questions seem to be uh, uh, a little bit gen generic in its form, but uh, they are of a great importance, at least to me. Um, so I have uh, a collection of questions which have puzzled me. Uh, um, so I, can I start? Um, the, first, the, first qu the first question is that why um, the particles the elementary particles are, are identical. Why are they identical? Yeah, the electron, for example, uh, the properties of the yeah. electron is invariant from one atom to another atom. Right. I mean, this kind of identicalism. Right. I, I, these are, you mean you're asking about the indistinguishability of the elementary particles? Yep. And, well, these are something which do follow from the axioms of quantum field theory. So. I do not have any better answer than to direct you towards standard textbooks in that context, unfortunately. And it's, uh, it's just the way it is, so to speak. So, so there's, there's uh, the indistinguishability, which means that you cannot tag particles. It's one of the deep facts. So the symmetry group is kind of like, exchange symmetry is kind of like a gauge symmetry, that they are identical. That if you exchange them, you get, a gauge, you get the same situation back. And uh, why it had to be the case is, is not, uh, is not Perhaps it's, you can really, I mean, this is not the re reason for it, but it's not, it's one version of it that if you could distinguish them, then you could tag them and it would be global charges. So for example, suppose you had 10 different electrons, electron type one, electron type two, electron type three, electron type four, et cetera. Then you say, aha, uh -huh. electron type one, I would call it charge one, electron charge two, I get a different charge. And so you get it totally, you get a global symmetry that way. So that's another way you could say that, okay, so the electrons should all behave, behave the same in some sense. That means you cannot distinguish them. Otherwise you get another concept of a global charge. That's not the usual description of why this is the case, but I'm giving a different perspective of it uh, because of my talk. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So you are stating that it's just in uh, one uh, way or another equivalent to the uh, symmetry principle. Well, it's related to the principles of uh, 
quantum field theory. So when you try to quantize quantum systems, you find that it follows from that, that's all. So the both statistics and Fermi statistics follow from, from quantizing fields. And so there's, 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 no quite, there's no choice, so to speak. So I'm just, I'm just trying to give a poetic description of it. Uh -huh. um, my second question is uh, something which is, uh, I have noticed uh, while studying, because it's uh, my first time to study general relativity uh, while I'm a university student, it has always been implicitly uh, said that the particles uh, move the energy geodesics. Yes. Why? You mean why? Why is that? That's Einstein's theory. First of all, before we say something, uh, when you say why, why should be explained in terms of some principle, correct? Uh huh. Right? Like when you start, for example, Euclidean geometry, you don't say, why do we have this? Why do we have that? You try to say, based on the five axioms of Euclidean geometry, try to derive things, right? That's okay. Physics is like that too. So when you say, why does the particles go in geodesic, that's part of Einstein's theory. Mm -hmm. So that's just like one of the axioms of Einstein's theory. So that's like, there's no why for that. Mm -hmm. yes, thank you, professor. Uh, uh, I, I, I have another question, with, which is the- Please go directly to your question. Because the, 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 the symmetry of matter and antimatter. This is a, a famous issue in physics. Can string theory uh, explain can, can there there does exist such an explanation within the context of uh, of string theory for that yes. uh, particular so first issue. of all the symmetry between matter and antimatter which is what's called charge conjugation is not true in our universe however what is true is that if you take charge conjugation which is matter antimatter and 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 couple it with time reversal and, and reflection in space coordinates what's called parity uh, then you get the symmetry of the of the universe and symmetry of our universe, and that fact can be derived from from relativistic uh, quantum field theory arguments. So you can understand what is called the CTP symmetry, which is the product of these things operations at the same time. So that works for quantum field theory as well as in string theory. So there's nothing changes in string theory. Mm -hmm. I, 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 okay, I, I understand that point, but I mean. Uh, we, I know for sure that the experimental fact that uh, there is no an equal amount of matter and antimatter in the observed universe as uh, far as yes. we know, but exactly. can, ex can a string theory offer such an explanation for such issue that, uh, that I see. Uh, so you are not talking one? about the symmetry, you are talking about asymmetry. Yes. Asymmetry. Yes. Oh. Asymmetry, not symmetry. Yes. Sorry, I misunderstood your question. Yes. There's an asymmetry between matter and antimatter. We have more matter than antimatter. And uh, so the charge conjugation symmetry and CP symmetry should be broken and they are broken in our universe. Uh, but the question that you're, you'd be asking is, okay, suppose they are broken, why do they get generated? And that depends on more details about cosmological models and the details of the high energy physics, which can also occur within string theory. So CP violation, for example, does occur in string theory models as well as particle models. And those have been used at some models where you can get an asymmetry of about 10 to the minus nine between matter and antimatter. So, so that tiny asymmetry has led, we believe, to the existence of matter versus antimatter in our universe. And yeah, so that could arise in string theory. Whether it has to arise, that's a different statement. And we don't know why it had to arise, but certainly the same mechanism that works in field theory does work in string theory. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. uh, I am sorry, but I have uh, uh, the general question, my last question. Um, Are you sure, Karim, that this is the last question? Uh, yeah. Um, what kind of advice would you like to give for a, a, young, a youngster like me uh, who is aspiring to become a theoretical physicist and who would like to, to attend a university like Harvard for his PhD? Uh, yes. I mean, I mean, I, to be more uh, more explicit, we don't have such the, the opportunities that many of the people on uh, many other countries have. But there are for, for sure some students who are at least good or. Uh... Yes, OK, I, I understand this question. 
Okay. Let me answer it in the following way. First of all, I do realize that uh, the opportunities are not equally distributed in the world, for sure. And I'm aware of that, for example, in Iran, where I'm from, and I also am aware of the same issues in, in the Arab world as similar. So indeed, you're right. Unfortunately, opportunities are not equal. However, let me also say, luckily, luckily, the internet is an equalizer in many ways of opportunities. A huge amount of information is available to you as well as to me equally. You can get as much information as I can through the internet today, luckily. So therefore, the first advice I have to somebody as long, young as you is that you can read much faster than I can because I'm getting old and you can read much faster information and absorb it. And so therefore you can compete with anybody, including me at Harvard. So therefore don't give up, first of all, because you think you, are, you, are, uh, you have a handicap because of where you are. It's not the case anymore in a way. You have a lot of resources today that equalizes the field for all scientists everywhere. For example, in my field, we have daily publication of all the papers that come out every day in the electronic archive, arxiv.org. And that archive is available to everybody all over the world at the same time. You don't get, I don't get any advantage over you or anybody else. And it's equal and you can get that information as I do. So the advice is to be, to not give up, not to think you're disadvantaged because you have now a lot of re reasonable tools at your disposal. And with the fact that you asked me so many questions today, it shows to me that you have a good curiosity and that will drive you. And I, I, my only uh, general advice is keep your curiosity. Don't give up and don't be disappointed or disenchanted with what might appear as, as what around you may not be what you find as an ideal condition. There are many opportunities uh, and you can study and absorb things and connect with the with the colleagues in the Arab world and where you are, as well as with the bigger, wider scientific community. And they're, you're, they were all welcoming. And we, for example, my participation here and others is the thing that we don't think science has borders. And so good ideas could come from anywhere, including from right from you. And we do appreciate that. And we do want you to be part of our community. Yes, uh, Professor, just uh, to help answer this question, because he write this question uh, on me and uh, I answer two things. I mean, just for the audience. So um, one thing I told him uh, now, to, uh, if you want, I mean, to uh, get a PhD position in, uh, in Harvard or Princeton, I mean, there is some requirement you need to have, uh, and he knows about this test, you need um, uh, good scores or best scores in GREs, uh, general and uh, uh, subjects, and you need also a high GPA, and also you need to publish something, maybe, so to make, because those, I mean, universities, they need calibration point to, I mean, to calibrate your uh, application with an American uh, student. This is the first one, uh, I mean, way. The second way is like, for example, Freddy Cachasso. Freddy Cachasso was in Venezuela. I mean, he applied to, he uh, finished his undergrad, uh, uh, I mean, studies in Venezuela. He applied for ICTP. He finished, uh, I mean, uh, his uh, study in uh, ICTP with uh, Naring Kumar, and he, I mean, uh, applied to, I think, Harvard. He was my student. Yes, you have, yes, your student. Then, I mean, he came, then he moved, I mean, to postdoc, then now he is, uh, I mean, uh, a member, faculty member at the Perimeter Institute. So there is many ways, I mean, to uh, go from our countries, I mean, to outside. All like Nikita Nikrasov. I mean, he solved some deep question when he was, I mean, at 17 years old or something like that. He was in Russia and he solved, I mean, uh, some deep questions, I mean, uh, uh, of written works or something. And uh, uh, he got acceptance to, uh, I mean, yes. a Princeton University. Yes, so, I, think, I think what, what I would like to say is that this is a good question that he's asking. And I think part of the issue is the psychology of the environment one is in. In other words, and I know that because uh, you, might, you might feel like you're surrounded by negativity, that things cannot be done in where you are and things are just, you know, this outside people can do it and you can just watch. That's not the case. And unfortunately, it's hard to get rid of the negativity 
and the psychological, incorrect psychological perception that one gets. This is not the case. And I'm, I was just trying to say that right now, because of internet, you don't even have to go other places like Harvard or Princeton or Ardell and so forth. You can easily connect from where you are to a lot of these resources available. And for example, like now seminars and all that, you can watch the videos of conferences happening all over the world, even without COVID, there are all these things, conferences happening, and you would see these talks on YouTube and so on. So you don't really need to go somewhere. You just have to have curiosity, energy to read and think. So in general, I think, of course, it's true that mentorship is important. You should try to connect with local talents in your area, with your faculty, and so on. And if it's difficult, yes, by all means, as Mohammed is saying, try to get resources outside as well, if you cannot get resources from within country as well. But try to also use the resources on the internet and other ways. Thank you, Professor, for these encouraging words. And I hope that all young people can use, make use of these uh, advices. Now, next question is from uh, Ms. Safa. Uh, hello, Professor. I hello. Uh, thank you for this uh, presentation. I um, I have a I have a question. Uh, how 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 tachyons can go of more than the speed of light? And we know that uh, the the second uh, principle of uh, Einstein so that the, the is uh, constant. Well, tachyons correspond to instability. So usually, when we talk about tachyon. We, we, what happens in the quantum theory is that it, it marks you're, you're on top of a potential. So then you just drop down. So trying to talk about the waves in that situation, in fact, gives you imaginary mass. So in other words, the mass squared of a tachyon is negative. So that just means that you're not going to be staying there. It's just going to drop down. That's all. So you shouldn't think about going higher than lower speed of light. It just means it's an instability. So that's the correct notion of thinking about the tachyon. So don't think about the tachyon like a particle. Tachyon is just an instability of the vacuum you're in. It's not a good vacuum. It's going to drop to somewhere else. So it's a transition situation. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, professor. Sir. You're welcome. Uh, and I'm glad that to see. I'm glad to see women interested in science in Arab world. And I hope there are more and more of you. More actually, of you. among the audience, there is a lot of women, but they are not sharing or asking questions. Maybe. Okay. Uh, hopefully, yeah. they will ask more questions next time. Yeah, hopefully. I think uh, Safa, Safa is uh, one of the best uh, undergrad students, I mean, in uh, University of Mohammed V in uh, Rabat University. So. Oh, very nice. Very nice. We have a question from Sir Bilal Nabil Al-Barri. Yes, please. Mr. Bilal. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Common. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, amazing uh, uh, lecture. And uh, in fact, I uh, kept reading about uh, uh, super strings uh, 30 years ago and uh, from the 90s. Okay. Now, uh, first question Does this theory have golden ages and winters? Because sometimes some uh, I read some articles opposing this uh, vision. Okay. That's one. Uh, second uh, question, please uh, Dark matter. Okay. Uh, reading some articles say that we have a lot of alternatives other than uh, dark matters. From uh, the uh, superstring theory, uh, what do you say? Thank okay, you as, far as, as far as any field, it has its ups and downs. So string theory has undergoing up and down, up and down, and it's still continuing. It's not like, you know, there, there are amazing discoveries, and then you develop the ideas, and then there's another discovery, and then you develop these ideas. So there's ups and downs in that sense. There, there are people who are impatient, in my opinion, in trying to connect string theory to the experiments. Mm -hmm. Of course, every theory of physics should be connected to experiments. And that's the ultimate goal of every theory of, of the universe. We are, unfortunately, the current technology of our understanding of string theory and the current technology available to experiments, we cannot get them to meet. Theory and experiments are far away from each other. Should we be disappointed? Yes, maybe, but should we give up? I would say no. We want to understand things and we want to push them closer. So I think the opponents, which just basically claim that, you know, string theory is just an idea, we cannot do anything with it, that's not a fair thing because we have learned many new physical ideas which seem to be important for our universe. Some of it I described in my talk, for example. So that's the answer to the first, first point. The second point was 
about uh, the dark matter. The dark matter is something which is not part of the standard model. And we want to, we know that they are there in our universe. And the question is, what is their nature? They don't interact very much with the light, so they're dark. And so therefore, there could be a lot of possibilities. So in string theory, you have a huge number of possibilities because string theory is, has this compactification space in the middle. And usually the matter we are made of usually gets localized in a piece of that space. So this space is big, small, but some smaller part of it is where we are from, where we get the matter. And then there are these other parts, like could be anything. And the, the, the dark matter could be any of those or some of those, we don't know. So it's like, it's like geography. It's like you're, you're given a globe and one of them is the country you're at. And that's what we call the standard model, your country. And then there are all these other countries around you. And you say, what, what could they be? Well, there are many choices, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, you have, unfortunately, just for one, one more question, please. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, uh, yes please. Um, uh, regarding the cosmological constant, which I read that uh, Einstein hated this uh, term and said that it was the uh, worst thing he had uh, ever done uh, when he added the cosmological constant. Now I'm reading that it, it could have some values in some contexts, positive values, okay? According to string theory, what do you say? Well, Einstein originally put cosmological constant with a positive value, and then he got rid of it because he thought that the theory, the universe does not need it. He put it there because he wanted to stabilize the universe. He had a curved space, a spherical space, mm -hmm. and with a positive cosmological constant, he stabilized it. Mm -hmm. With a value, surprisingly, close to the observed value today. <laughs> I see. So the yes. value that Einstein put in his theory was proportional to the density of matter. Mm -hmm. And the current dent cosmological constant today is measured to be close to the density of the matter too. So he was lucky. Of course, I'm not saying he, he, he has any right to claim victory because his reasoning was not correct, but he got the right value actually. And then he took it back. And then now, yeah. we, know there is, now we know that there is dark energy, which is cosmological constant. So it's in the universe. And so the question is, what is the explanation? And we still don't have a deep explanation of why it's there. It could be a minimum of a potential as I was describing in my talk, or it could be a rolling of a potential, the value of the potential. Why it should be, doesn't have to be, but it seems to be there. And we have to try to understand what is its nature. It's one of the biggest puzzles in the universe to understand deeply what kind of reasoning gives you this dark energy. Cosmological constant is nothing but the value of the potential at the minimum or as it is rolling down. It's the same thing. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Professor, uh, we have the last question from Mr. Khalil. Yes, before this one thing, um, because I remember, Professor, for the formula of the mass and uh, the cosmological constant, you, you said, uh, so um, what's the importance or from where we get this, I mean, uh, I mean, formula, because I mean, for example, in supersymmetry, uh, A, it's half, I think. Sorry, which one are we talking about? I don't understand. Between I what mean, the relation between the mass modes and lambda. Mass modes and lambda. Well, potential, you mean. So usually yeah, yeah. you get you get a, if you have a particle of mass m going to the loop, you get corrections of the four m to the four. That's just just the dimensional analysis. So uh, if you comp uh, compute the compute the like d four p log p squared plus m squared, it gives you m to the four of no, the order no. m to the four. That's all. Mr. Khalil, your question, please. Hello. Hello. Uh, Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vapa, for your uh, conference. Uh, my name is Khalid Al-Bukhari. I'm a PhD student. I study inflationary uh, cosmology. Mm -hmm. And I have a one question concerned within this, uh, this one plant on Jacques. Yes. You know, it, there, there's, a, I mean, there's an article in uh, 2018 that states that there is a contradiction between this uh, conjecture and uh, the, the, the slow roll uh, inflation. There's some parameters of slow roll inflation which are, uh, in, fa in fact, uh, in contradiction with this uh, conjecture. Uh, and uh, does uh, string theory give any uh, additional ideas or way to solve or does, does it exclude the theory of uh, inflation? This is no, it doesn't exclude it. I mentioned the conjecture you're mentioning is the one I, I made with my collaborators and I reviewed it in this talk. 
uh, it gives you slow row parameter, which is uh, inflation wants a small slow row parameter, which is possible. It's kind of like a fine tuned one. So I think I think that with the, with the ideas of string theory, inflation is not ruled out, but in my opinion, is highly fine tuned. So it's almost ruled out. So it's very unnatural. That's all. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Professor Cameron. Uh, Dr. Akram, I think we finished the question. So would you please to close the lecture? So thank you so much, Professor Vafa. I mean, again, for this opportunity, I mean, you gave the talk for the public. It was very useful. I mean, the puzzles won. And uh, now for uh, the experts, I mean, you mentioned um, the motivations behind Swamp Land program and uh, the applications in cosmology, particle physics. And you answer many fundamental questions. Um, I think um, I am happy to see you personally. I mean, me or the graduate students or professors in our uh, countries, Arabic countries after this COVID-19, maybe in Algeria, Morocco, Egypt, or elsewhere. Um, thank you so much again for accepting my invitation. And um, next guest, just for telling to you and the others, will be um, in April, in the beginning, uh, in April, it will be two guests, um, two important guests. The first one will be Gerard Tuft, and the second one will be uh, Edward Witt. So thank you so much. And you can give Professor the, uh, the last words, I mean, to the, yeah. your audience. So, well, it was a pleasure to be invited to give this talk. I love to be more connected with my Arab colleagues and students and faculty alike. Uh, I have enjoyed visits to some of the Arabic countries, Egypt and Morocco in particular, I have been to. I haven't been to many others, which I love to see, but I hope to do that, hopefully in the near future. I'm thankful for your participation and listening to my talks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for your time. Thank you for this great lecture. Thank you. We can see you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 ترقبوا جلسات على أكتاف العمالقة في شهر أبريل المزيد من المحاضرات المزيد من الفيزيائيين العظماء نلقاكم على خير والسلام عليكم السلام عليكم شكرا جزيلا